All right, before I start, I wanted to uh, look back at Alexei's last slide, BPF's why statement. He says, to innovate, to enable others to innovate, and to challenge what is possible. So with that, I'm looking at Verified Boot with BPF and kind of asking some questions around that. So who am I? I'm Neil Capron. I work for Google on the Android uh, kernel integrity team. And I have been looking at implementing modern BPF support in Android. Um, so a couple key things that we need to understand is that there's three BPF user stories. We have networking, system, and vendor uh, use cases. And each of these user stories have a separate update and release timeline. Uh, additionally, Android runs on devices that are in the ecosystem for seven to 10 years. Uh, so we have a long-term compatibility uh, requirement here. And then the other key piece here is new Android versions must run on previous kernels. So some of you have may, some of you may have seen this slide uh, last fall at L LPC 23. And this was my proposal there. Uh, you can see the, the three different user stories, green, which is system BPF programs, the orange, which is vendors, and then the mainline networking module, which can be updated independently of the system. Um, currently, Android has a Android-specific BPF library, um, which the networking and system applications use. And so we are trying to integrate upstream libbpf, one, so that we can modernize everything, but also start contributing back. Um, we need to maintain a, an access control mechanism, which is what is highlighted kind of down in the green uh, in the kernel space, which is basically a, a program type allow list and an attach point allow list. So each different user case may have a different portion of allowed either attach points or program types. So we need to also be able to update this as time progresses. So at the time, we hadn't run this by Android security. We, we kind of wanted to get in, input from the community. And ultimately, yes, it, it looked good. There are already LSM hooks for BPF program load and BPF program attach. And we feel like we could leverage those pieces to build this mechanism. Uh, the other thing to highlight in this is that it's showing the libbpf libraries up at the top statically linked to those different use cases. So security says, this sounds great, but you must maintain verified boot. And followed up with that, that basically just said, just load it in the kernel. And I probably had the same response as many of you in the room with, uh, an overwhelmed, complex uh, viewpoint there. So the, the core issue with maintaining verified boot is that libbpf performs all these relocations to the bytes on disk. In Android, we're using DM Verity, uh, so we can authenticate the, the bytes on the disk, but libbpf modifies that, and so the kernel doesn't have a reference back to those original uh, verified bytes, and so it breaks that, that chain of trust, and that's a potential attack vector. So what approaches have we looked at? We've looked at a single trusted loader. That's basically where we're at right now with Android. Um, we have a BPF loader, which has its own library. Um, it's very limited. It does not perform many of the, the upstream features. Uh, we've looked at signed shared library objects. The downside of this becomes then we, as our vendors have older released BPF binaries, we need to maintain compatibility going forward. So we end up shipping 10 or more versions of libbpf signed libraries with the ecosystem if there's a breaking change. We've looked at things like relocation playbooks and quickly discarded that. Um, Things like light skeleton. I don't believe that the light skeleton accomplishes what we need with the or the multi-vendor sources. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I would like to engage in that conversation a little more. We had we had a side conversation earlier, and 
additionally signing uh, of the actual BPF programs, and I don't think we, we have a solution due to that relocation limitation. Yes? I just had a, an, another approach I was just curious if you looked at. Did you consider um, like early boot loading the programs, which would sort of sidestep the malicious user, right? Like if, if you could get close enough to the trusted boot, Yep. That you would say, hey, this is tr we trust this because there's nothing else running. So that's exactly what Android does already. Right. So we, we are very limited in doing this. But the thing is, we want to open up the ecosystem to our vendors, to our other partners on the trusted system uh, beyond what the system or so networking piece so can it's do. it's beyond just like Android's core BPF set. It's the like running the third party thing on top that runs uh, BPF. Yeah, primarily phone or silicon vendors that want to augment the Android open source core system with their own okay. customized programs for their devices. And you, you don't want to give those vendors access to your early boot for... Can you, can you repeat the question? Um, <clears throat> You don't want to build some sort of chain loading in early boot where you would give like those vendors that have sort of some sort of trust notion. I mean, they have to have some sort of trust notion in this context anyways. Yeah. But you don't want to provide them a way to get their image or BPF thing into the early boot and chain load it there. So the, the current Android loader does that. Oh, okay. And that's one of the mechanisms is basically we currently only allow socket filter vendor programs right. um, because we, our library is so locked down for that and we're trying to build that access control mechanism um, for what they're allowed to access. So before we open up things like test points and, and KFUNCs and whatever else, we need to build that, that uh, attach point access control mechanism also to prevent uh, potential compatibility issues with, say, networking, if they were to update their, their network BPF programs and use something that a vendor is using historically right. that's deployed across the ecosystem. Sorry if you explained it before. No, no, no. no. I, it's, I, I highly encourage you. There's a link at the bottom okay. of this. Um, the the talk goes into more detail about the Android BPF okay. security module. And then the, the problem with that approach is just sort of the, the, the lack of flexibility. Like, the, the vendors have to really be in your kind of image build process to even exactly. be part of that discussion. Okay. Yep. Uh, additionally, the, the lack of libbpf right now, so everything is built around our own library, and so we're trying to integrate with, with libbpf, but then uh, um, we have that object lifecycle management okay. piece. So. Cool. I'll let, let, let you keep going. Sorry. Yep. No, I, I welcome all, all commentary and questions. So. So from there, I, I kind of took a step back and said, what would it actually take to move the loader and the kernel? And so this, this is kind of highlighting the difference here, where instead of doing all the relocations in user space, uh, we start looking at the kernel space. Um, this way, you, you pass a file descriptor, which is on the DM Verity file system, or for those that aren't using DM Verity, you could have a signature validation on the BPF bytecode. The kernel could then verify that signature and then parse the ELF file in the kernel and, and perform everything there. So what does that look like? Bare, base, you know, bare minimum, we're extending the syscall, uh, not a big deal. Uh, user space parses a file descriptor to the kernel. It's pretty simplified. Um, kernel opens the ELF file. There's already ELF support as far as um, there's several spots that ELF is used in the kernel, um, the kernel itself, kernel modules, things like that. We need to parse the ELF file, we need to verify it, um, and then we need to actually perform everything that the loader is doing, uh, creating maps, past programs to verify, et cetera. Reality is it's a lot more complex than you know just that, and so this is just a subset of everything, but I, I really started digging in step by step of what it would take. Um, so at this point, I basically have the first three prototypes. Um, I started looking at ELF format, I'm new to that, um, and quickly realized that we don't have a standard for the ELF format. And so ELF is basically a, um, a, a contract between the loader and the library, which creates the output file. Um, and, and each of these ELF standards could be uh, unique. So while libbpf has its ELF format documented, uh, and I'll go into that a little bit, um, the, the Go library, or the Rust library, could have a different contract. Um, 
So we'll expand on that. So th there's all these steps, right? And I, I took a step. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering about that library, like Elf kind of thing. Because I, I think from the Go library, like at least the Cilium EPF Go library perspective, we're aligning with the libbpf okay. approach. I don't know if Rust folks want to do something different, but I, I do see some value in agreeing. But. I haven't looked at the Go library or the Rust library, but there's no specification That's right. saying that they absolutely this is how it works. So it's great that you are aligning with that, but there could be other pieces there. So um, I kind of got overwhelmed. This is pretty recent. Of, you know, step one is aligning the industry, basically. Um, yeah. So moving on, looking at uh, libbpf's dependencies, uh, zlib and uh, libelf. Um, kernel has zlib, and then there's limited elf handling. You can see bin format, kexec, elf, and uh, module main. So there's there's a header defining the the health for that the high-level file structure for ELF, but then the actual format of the application of the ELF file is not defined. So what benefits does this have? One, it enables a verified boot path, not only for Android, but others, because you could have that signature validation on the BPF bytecode itself prior to the relocations. Um, the loader development Currently, every time a new feature is added, the, the independent libraries need to you know, add that feature. Um, the library incompatibility story. So if a vendor builds a BPF program and ships it with an Android device or some other uh, ecosystem, and then we want to update libbpf to a, a newer version, that could potentially break something. And, and while we you know, try to minimize that, it is a, a concern that we, we need to look at. And then also the BPF preload. We could start passing these in, or embedding these ELF files into the kernel. It sounds like there is some support there in um, the, the light skeleton. There's a question in the back. Oh, okay. Um, so some of, the, some of the other pieces that I had questions about is how do we handle the life cycle? You know, basically we're passing a single file descriptor that could create many objects um, in kernel space for BPF programs. You know, how do we return that back? Do we simply create directory entries um, and then pass a directory file descriptor back to the, the call? Um, the big one is the ELF format specification. Do we want to align? Um, and then as I started looking at the ELF format specification, I learned more about the, the compatibility across runtimes, um, and so that kind of opened up a new can of worms. Um, so I, I wanted to take a step back. I, I am new to the environment, um, new to the ecosystem, and I ha may have missed some of the conver conversations that have previously occurred around this. I've crawled, crawled some of the um, mailing lists looking for things, but I, I have a feeling that a lot of it happened privately, so I, I haven't gotten a lot of the details. So with that said, that's about all I have. Um, there's a follow-up on the ELF format, but I wanted to open it up to the room to provide some counters. I, I've seen different approaches, things like uh, embedding the lib, libbpf in the user space Linux, um, other things there. Has this approach been taken of parsing ELF files? Um, are there concerns? Uh, I have a few questions. Absolutely. First, uh, can you clarify what you mean by that BPF object lifecycle there? What is the Android use case for life? What explain more what lifecycle? What do you mean? So the lifecycle being basically the programs would be loaded at one at a certain time, and then a system service could then access the maps later on. Yeah. So pinning things like that. Um, we would need to extend the format to basically describe each of these pieces of what we want the kernel to do with the ELF um, and, and these programs and um, how, like what happens as far as the pinning process and how do we communicate that back to user space as to what gets exposed. That's, that's lib BPFFS, right? You, create, you pin the maps and programs on the file system and the user space can get an FD for that. Yeah. The other question is, I, so we talked about trusted loaders there, right? 
Now, Android has trusted some level of trusted user space that ships with it, right? Yep. Why do it in the kernel? Sorry, what? Why do it in the kernel? Why not do it as a part of your uh, a trusted user space component? This goes back to the compatibility, right? So if we start talking about these objects, the shared objects, signed shared objects, or um, statically linked things, when you have all of these different sources of BPF programs that may have been compiled against different pieces. The, the compatibility story is totally up to you, right? Like in the kernel, you are, you're limiting your loader, your uh, uh, relocations and all to one particular logic. You can do the same limitation in user space as well. You can say, I'm only going to authorize this shared object to be the, to be the loader. So the same dynamic, the same compatibility story can be done in user space. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the kernel. So I, I still don't get it why in the kernel. I do get the fact where you had the initial LSM program being being loaded as a part of the kernel and have that bytecode verified and stuff, the, the, the BPF preload use case. But you don't need to have the whole ELF parsing and effectively all of the BPF implemented in the kernel. So I, I still am not seeing the full buy-in for this use case. Okay. Is there any other feedback? I'm seeing some smiles. I'd love to, I, I'd love to hear it, right? So you mentioned you looked at light skeleton, but somehow it doesn't work. Can you elaborate? My concern is that it doesn't support the features that it, it the, I guess what features it supports. And I haven't dug in enough to it. Um, it sounds like recently things like core in the kernel, which I wasn't aware of um, prior to today, may have enabled a lot of the pieces. But my understanding was that Light Skeleton did not support core. So that was a, a breakdown in my understanding. So we're trying to enable core as, as part of this process. The, the, the initial signing patches I sent on the BPF mailing list, they used Light Skeleton uh, and add, added some stuff, and they had core in it. So core has been there for a while in Light Skeletons. Okay. I, I, do th I do think that having to recompile the kernel when something in the BPF loading story changes, especially with the ELF not standardized yet, is not a good idea. You should keep it away from the kernel. Uh, it, it, like the yeah, I, I have maybe uh, another kind of, um, maybe a bit of a perspective. Maybe this is closer to the, the life cycle kind of stuff you're talking about. Um, I think our use case is probably quite different from your use case, so, so like, yeah. take, take this as a gr grain of salt, right? But like, so Cilium has uh, many different programs, many different maps. The content of those maps is, uh, you know, affects a lot about the way that the networking is actually going to work. Um, and so when it comes to like, say, an upgrade, what, what we'd like to be able to say is like, we can do a hitless atomic upgrade from one version to another version. Um, and what this may end up meaning is like loading specific maps in certain values, uh, loading programs in certain orders and, and attaching. So we end up getting quite complex, I think. Now, I say that just to say there is a possibility at some point that things get to that sort of level of complexity. Um, so it, the upgrade story and migration of maps and content and stuff like that, exactly how that would fit into even a model like this is, is a, a longer term question I would have. So probably a little down the road. Yeah, like not, not something that maybe even if we thought this is a good idea, not something you'd have to deal with immediately, but like on the horizon, I guess. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.